Okay, so uh, it's time. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for attending this webinar by Randy Oliver. My name is Pat Bono, president of New York Bee Wellness, which is an independent educational grassroots charitable 501c3 organization. Its mission is to educate small scale sideliner and beginning beekeepers. We do have a YouTube site with past in person and online presentations, including many by Randy. New York Bee Wellness sent out newsletters several times a year. It has also um, conducts statewide surveys twice a year for non-migratory beekeepers in New York State. 2022 was our ninth year of collecting data. Okay, Randy, um, so glad to see you back. Thank you very much. What's to do with you? Well, I just I was uh, speaking in uh, at a conference in Germany last week and felt a chill on the way home and came down with a case of COVID. So uh, if I'm a little snurfily right now, it's because I'm on the tail end of my first COVID uh, infection. Okay, so let's just give you an update here on some of the research projects. This will not be all the research projects. We'll see how far, how far we can get to it here that I've been involved in this year. <clears throat> so my main areas of, of focus are first understanding Varroa. That's still our number one problem. And then developing and testing sustainable varroa management methods. Back in um, when varroa first hit and wiped me out way back in the early 1990s, um, I guess they were able to continue by getting uh, fluvalinate strips, the synthetic miticide. And they failed very fairly quickly. And I tried uh, the Kumafos strips, and they were just scary to me and that kind of comb contamination. So uh, to 2020, uh, 2001, was the last year that we used any synthetic miticide in our operation. We run a commercial operation in California, pollinate the almonds. So we have uh, been able to treat, to keep our colonies alive and healthy uh, for over 20 years using only the quote, natural treatments, the organic acids and essential oils and doing quite well. So um, uh, we're kind of walking the walk showing that it's certainly possible they, they are much more sustainable than the synthetic miticide, which are easier for the mite to evolve resistance to. But I consider those only a stopgap method. Um, what we need to really have is develop resistant uh, bees. And that's a big focus. We have a large, large scale uh, selective breeding program for my resistance. Going on uh, seven years of intensive selection and making considerable progress. So we're fairly happy with where we're at. I'm not gonna cover um, the, that tonight. Um, and I also work a lot with uh, improving colony nutrition and testing and supplements. I don't know if we covered that before, uh, research on that, Pat. If not, you ought to get me back on to cover that from my uh, 2020 testing. So let's focus now on summer mite treatments. <clears throat> I got a quick here first. There's been a lot of interest in um, propolis as a varroa sign. Um, and here's a few papers that have come out in recent years. Um, uh, proposing that we might be able to use uh, propolis, <laughs> perhaps spraying it in, a, in an alcohol tincture in the uh, cells, in the brood cells, to see if that uh, will affect varroa. Well, I thought, wow, if, if it works that well, the bees would have already been, been doing that, it seems to me. So the question is, um, um, how much propolis is there in old brood combs? When we look into old, old brood combs, um, it would be easy for us to determine whether the bees do indeed line them with propolis, because as we all know, if you take propolis and, and put it into a high proof alcohol, ethanol, it will quickly dissolve and turn it brown. So I ran a very quick, quick and dirty experiment. I took pieces of dark brood comb and put it into uh, three beakers here and beaker, pieces of um, uh, scraped propolis, um, uh, put it into these beakers and then tried three different solvents, hexane, uh, ethanol, and acetone. And you can see if you just take propolis, put it into any of those solvents, um, doesn't do much in the hexane, but it certainly dissolves quickly in the ethanol and in the acetone, turns the solution very dark. If, if indeed there's much propolis in old bead combs, the, the uh, beakers above they look the same color here, and you see very, very little color in those. So this is a very quick and dirty test, but it would suggest that the honeybees have not chosen or not under evolutionary uh, pressure, um, put much propolis into the brood combs. So anyway, let's move on from that. And what, what else we can use? Um, you can use my Varroa model to figure out, um, plan your Varroa management strategies. And um, 
this is for a default kind of a, a, um, an annual season similar to what you would have in New York with a fairly long winter where you have a, a long good break. And typically the mite population is gonna build up in the middle. And what I found is in most areas at moderate latitudes, you're gonna need three uh, strong treatments a year, uh, get at least 90% reduction three times a year in order to keep your mite levels down close to zero, which in our operation, that's what we like to do. We like to keep our mite levels very close to uh, zero. Um, mite counts from mite wash of half cup of bees in the zero to one range uh, early in the spring and early summer, maybe getting up to around five mites per half cup of bees um, in uh, late July, and then taking back down in August um, to take it back in the winter at uh, close to zero mite, mite counts. So this is the key time right now when there's honey on the hive of what we're allowed to use. And we're down to formic acid, hop guard, or oxalic acid. I talked about hop guard, I think uh, last time I spoke with you guys, it can be used uh, during the honey flow, but it does take multiple treatments and it's kind of pricey. Um, I may get to formic acid um, tonight. I've got the slides if I don't know about time. But mainly I'm gonna focus on using oxalic acid. And my guess is that's likely why much of the audience is on here right now. Worldwide, there's a huge interest in using oxalic acid for rural management. And here is my grandson, uh, writer, demonstrating why oxalic acid is called oxalic acid. This is plant is called oxalis. It's a common weed in California. This is buttercup oxalis. And every California kid grows up, we call it sour grass. It's not a grass in any way. But if you pluck off the stems and chew on them, they taste like lemonade. It, they're a solution of oxalic acid and sugar. Oxalic acid named after the plant oxalis. So very, very safe for human beings um, at moderate doses and very common ingredient in our food, in our, especially in our vegetables. We also now recently got oxalic acid vaporization approved for use uh, while honey supers are on the hive. And I know a lot of beekeepers on the East Coast just really like using this, um, but it's a big question of how efficacious it actually is when there is brood in the hive. Now, when there's no brood, it can be quite efficacious. When there is brood in the hive, uh, it's far less efficacious. Here's a um, kind of an extreme example here of a beekeeper from Seattle who was vaporizing at four day intervals. And these are the mite drops out of, this, out of this hive every four days. Now, if it were efficacious at reducing the mites after two or three treatments, these mite drops would drop to zero. You can see he's dropping over a thousand mites after each treatment here, day after day after day. Finally starts taking it down. By this time he's done what, six treatments right now, six vaporizations, seven, eight, nine, 10 vaporizations. And wow, this time he finally got it. And then waited a few days and go, oh my God, the mites are climbing again. I didn't get them. Starts knocking out another over a thousand mites and finally starts to get it down here. So he essentially spent the whole last half of the summer vaporizing every four days to get his mites under control. I got, I haven't published it yet, but I've got data sets like this from beekeepers from all over the United States and other uh, parts of the world who have taking the time to do these kind of mite drops counts after vaporizations. I'll be publishing an article on it, showing how, how poor, low level efficacy when there's brood in the hive, typically takes about seven vaporizations to really get your mites under control while there's brood in the hive. One of those reasons is that the allowable dose of oxalic acid on the label uh, from EPA is unfortunately uh, too low. You're only allowed to use one gram of oxalic acid dihydrate per brood chamber. This is some recent research from Cameron uh, Jack in Florida. And what he showed was it really, the one gram per box, you're not going to get that good of mite control. It really takes uh, two to maybe four, probably about three grams per box to um, get good mite control. And um, um, the bees will handle that uh, fairly well. Um, but we probably need to get a label change. So this dose is not yet approved, although I know some beekeepers are ramping it up. <clears throat> now, in my own operation, my, my crew and me are not, not excited about oxalic acid vaporization at all. We do the low efficacy, the um, 
um, the time and the effort and the cost involved in putting it on, uh, it takes much longer than, than say a dribble or putting on an extended release. And mainly the operator's safety. We just don't like working with something. We have to be so careful about not getting it in our eyes or, or inhaling it. So <clears throat> I was curious back, well, can we use a dribble method instead? What if we did multiple dribbles in the hive, similar to the multiple vaporizations? What would happen uh, 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 if we did that? So this spring, uh, with a couple of helpers, I uh, did that. So what we tried is uh, doing four dribbles at four day intervals to see what would happen. Uh, five milliliters per cm of bees. Was first at the, I mean, it's the hot dribble on my website for oxalic acid treatment table. Um, that's usually recommended for summer treatment. Um, uh, we did it with 50% sugar syrup. Then also we tried it with 40% glycerin. It's an alternative to sugar. The reason being is that the bees um, tend to eat the sugar syrup and then they may transfer it to the brood as they add uh, nectar from their crop or oxalic sugar syrup to the uh, jelly to feed the larvae. These don't like to taste the glycerin. So there was indications that maybe glycerin is better than the sugar syrup for the dribble. It is not approved, so I'm not recommending do, doing that. <clears throat> then the other one is some research out of Estonia by uh, Hale Tulema, indicating he tested uh, different amounts of dribble, anywhere from five milliliters up to uh, 70 some milliliters. He said, well, about 20 milliliters actually works better than the five. The sugar wasn't even so important, but when he added some time wall to it, which is very irritating and toxic to the mites, um, he got very good mite control. Unfortunately, he was doing a fall treatment. It was a little bit irritating to the bees and caused some adverse effects. So I set up um, 20 milliliter dribbles uh, in glycerin um, with a, about a third the amount of time while he did it, just to allow some time while irritation to the bees, but uh, not to um, cause adverse effects to the um, irritation of the mites, not to cause adverse effects to the bees. And here's um, um, one of my, my helpers right here. Uh, putting on um, the oxalic acid, we measured it very carefully and applied it at four day uh, intervals. Here's the results. I was be quick and dirty. And a lot of these charts, what I'm going to show you is a history, or not histogram, but a uh, bar charts or column charts. The blue column will be the starting mite count. And I always do it in mites per half cup of bees. I don't do any arithmetic on this. I just tell you what I actually see. So these are high mite counts. This is like a, a 50 mites. And a half cup on this particular high. And then the red uh, column is your, the uh, count after treatment. So we put it, we started on June 7th, and then on June 24th, after um, three weeks, we took my counts again. So you see in this hive, the um, my count actually went way up on that one, but the rest of the hives, it went down. So there was, it was some uh, efficacy, but not a whole lot. That's not a very good my reduction after four treatments. Uh, in the, um, with the, uh, with the time all right here, um, again, not that good efficacy. A couple more went up. And then uh, the 20 milliliters, just with the, um, the, with the water, um, very poor efficacy right here. Oh, I can see there's a mistake here. I got to check back on my notes. I don't, I don't know about the glycerin, huh? That's interesting. Okay. And then in the control group, um, the mite counts tended to stay the same and went up a bit. So really, we were not too excited by bro reduction. We wouldn't want to see all blue. Um, and no red on these uh, uh, graphs right here. We also measured colony frame strength, cluster size, in the same trial to see if there's an effect of those dribbles on colony strength. And as you can see that the um, colonies, there's, they did not grow much. A lot of them went down. The red bar was lower than the blue bar, but not any particular growth except in the control group. Look how the control group, those colonies all grew during that period of time. That was kind of an eye opener because that means that, prop, that possibly there was an adverse effect upon colony growth or adult mortality due to that, um, those four dribbles there. So we dropped, dropped uh, uh, multiple dribbles as a mite control method. Now, we certainly haven't given up on oxalic acid. Oxalic acid is a food grade miticide. A bunch of spinach uh, has a lot of spinach, parsley, uh, chard, uh, rhubarb especially, all have very high levels of oxalic acid. So you get plenty of it in your diet already. It's not a worry at all to anybody for human safety. 
the liquid application method is much safer than either. I use a formic acid, and we use tons of formic acid ourselves. Um, but the oxalic, much safer to handle and much safer than the oxalic vaporization. Other than the dribble on brood, there's very little setback on brood rearing by other application methods. And I haven't seen any clean issues as we get with formic acid. So the big question is the poor efficacy if there is brood uh, present. Yeah, go ahead, Pat. Yeah, you gotta unmute yourself. Uh, just to clarify, are you treating individual colonies or the whole apiary when you do the trials? Depends. <laughs> um, I, well, I don't know, how can you treat a whole apiary? You have to open individual hives, so that's individual colonies. I'm not quite clear on the question. Um, do you treat the colonies individually or the apiary as a whole? So all the hives in the apiary? Oh, Jenny will treat all the hives in the apiary if, unless there's more hives than there are in the trial. So, um, but yes, there, each hive is individually treated and they're generally all, and we, we don't want to add a location effect. So in a, any trial, all the colonies will be in the same yard unless we're running an ep, a replicate in another yard, which but you'll see later on, we replicate some trials in several yards and maybe do all the hives in each of those several yards. Did that answer the question? I hope so, yes. Okay. <laughs> so there was a really good idea that came out in Arsena. They were working on it before um, 2015, published it in 2015 uh, uh, by a group called uh, Alluin CAP. CAP stands for Coordinated Action Project. It's a beekeepers coordinated action project to figure out how to deal with Varroa. And Alluin is a town there. So it's called Alluin CAP because it's the Beekeepers Coordinated Action, Co coordinated action Project. <clears throat> they just realized you could extend the release of oxalic acid, kind of like we do with the synthetic mitocytes by putting them in plastic strips, by putting them on a cellulose strip, dissolving it in glycerin. The oxalic acid dissolves in the glycerin. So very, very promising. Um, not yet registered in, the, in, in 49 of the United States. Um, it is registered in one right now. Uh, but very, very promising. I've done a lot, a lot of research on this. We'll be talking about this. Now, I do get it every year a pesticide research authorization from the state of California to do this. As a hot beekeeper, you need to check, if you want to try, experiment with it, you need to check with your state lead agency. The EPA allows experimental use in your own hives of extended release of oxalic acid, as long as you're keeping it local to your own hives and um, um, but that's up to your state agency whether they whether they have a more restrictive uh, rule. Now, in New Zealand, the government was much more reasonable. Rather than having to deal with all the hooplas and taking on the responsibility of saying what's safe and what's not safe, what you got to do, they realized that the three natural compounds used for <clears throat> um, varroa control: oxalic acid, formic acid, and thymol are of no threat to uh, humans in general, uh, to the food supply, no threat to the environment. They're all natural in treatments. So really it's just up to the beekeeper to figure out how to use them. So they have an own use exemption in uh, New Zealand um, under this advertising and own use guidance for compounds. And a beekeeper, so long as they're not selling it and using it only on their own colonies, is free to use oxalic acid, formic acid, or time all any way they want. I propose to uh, the EPA that they do this for us beekeepers here in the United States and just get it out, off their table. They don't have to worry about it. Put it all on us. Um, it was a no-go with EPA, unfortunately. If anybody knows a state legislator or a senator who wants to push this through, boy, there's no reason I can see we couldn't do this in the state in the United States also. So in New Zealand, the bee supply houses sell kits like this. They're not allowed to sell a formulated product, but they can sell the dry oxalic acid, they can sell the glycerin, and they can sell the cardboard strips and the instructions for the beekeeper to make their own and put them in their hives. Here's the other state of the 50 in the United States that Jack Rath from Better Bee, who's a veterinarian, pushed through with their state legislator to get a 2EE authorization for using extended release oxalic acid. So it is now legal to use 
in the state of Vermont. I can't see any reason at all why beekeepers don't push to get it legal in every one of our states. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you break the law. I'm suggesting that you push and change the laws. <clears throat> so as far as my quick uh, summary of, of research, as far as the effective dose, what I found is with, we use the uh, Swedish sponges. If you have two, uh, a full sponge cut in two, so two half sponges actually. Here's our starting mite counts right here. Each one of these is a different yard uh, that we tested this, this in. And um, uh, you look at the ending mite counts. So, and I'm starting with very high starting mite counts. So these are, this is 40 mites and a half cup of bees right here. This is 70 mites and a half cup of bees. Look what happened after 42 days, 70 mites down to zero. Okay, uh, 65 mites down, down to, looks like 10 mites right there. Yet incredible control. There's always a few outliers here. And we'll talk about those later. These are the curious, why we always get a very few outliers. But with almost any treatment, actually in any treatment I've ever used, there are always outliers, okay? Um, so we can get 90% efficacy across the board uh, easily. And there's apparently, I haven't seen, with the treatment I'm using, the one-to-one -one ratio, any kind of adverse effects. Here's, here's the brood pattern of colonies after having these two half sponges on for um, uh, two months right here. You can see the brood looks great in these colonies. I get uh, photos like this sent to me by beekeepers from all over the world. This is actually from a beekeeper who runs bees in your state, uh, Pat, and uh, moves up and down the coast. Um, says, Randy, this is like beekeeping in the old days. This is the best honey, honey crops and the healthiest bees I've, I've I've seen in many, many years since before Varroa. So uh, <laughs> I love getting these proud pictures, like a proud parents looking at their colonies after um, how healthy bees can be if you just keep the mite, mite down to close to zero. Now here was the interesting thing, yeah. Um, someone asks, um, in your Varroa treatment model, you have no treatment in October. Is that despair doing something to the queen to lose her before winter? In October, we're feeding our bees um, uh, with pollen sub to get them to get that winter cluster built up. So you want to be proactive to get all your mite level down before October. If you're waiting for October, it's too late. That means you're going to have too much viruses going into the winter. So that's, if you want to be proactive, you, you get the mites down in August. October is being reactive. Okay. So we were able to run um, trials also at these very high elevation yards. These are at 6,500 feet up in the Sierra Nevada. I was working with some grad students who needed us to bring colonies of bees up where there were no honeybees existing until we brought them in. They wanted to see what, how they compared to the native pollinators and working with these plants. So I use this for an opportunity to test also. And that was a very different, uh, uh, we, at, back at home by that time, it had dried up. There's no more honey flow, no more drone luring. We went up there and because it was high elevation, the honey flow was just starting plenty of pollen. The bees build up, they fill a, a deep super full of beautiful honey. And the notable thing is they rear drones like crazy. Like I've never seen them rear drones before, which means drones are the best burrow food there is. So that tells me they should, the, the mite population should have exploded up there. But the main thing was there are no other bees in the surrounding area. So no drift of mites coming in with those bees from other hives in their, in their Look at the absence of red right here. Tremendous mite control of those high elevation yards. There was one other fourth yard of a pollination contract that we had in an isolated valley out in the middle of the desert in Nevada. So no other honeybees there. And the bees came back looking even better than this. There were just no mites remaining, colonies full of honey. So that really made me think, wow, maybe it's that mite immigration that is the problem that we saw on those outliers down below. And I have some data, I haven't published this yet, from 2018, where I tracked mite immigration coming in with uh, semi-weekly uh, uh, counts, bi-weekly, semi-weekly counts. So uh, two counts, two, two sticky board counts a week in colonies that we had eliminated the mites from with miticides and saw this big immigration of mites coming in um, day after day into there. So that could be an issue. So this year I had a chance um, um, to uh, do a trial using entrance guards to see if maybe they would reduce my immigration. So we did two different uh, field trials. We just finished them up. I've just cranked the data from one, but not for the other. These are a, a very clever stainless steel entrance guard that's reversible 
for um, um, different sizes of entrances that you can screw very easily on the front of your hive. I like, I like the elegance of stainless steel things that I know will last forever. This is one of the yards. So here's the yards, plenty of crowded colonies. So plenty of uh, opportunity for a drift of bees from one to the other. What we did in this yard, we went to uh, measure the effect of the guards up, um, to see if it would help with the an oxalic, extended release oxalic acid treatment over the course of the season in the summer. So we repeated this in six different yards, a total of 133 colonies. <clears throat> now, when I asked my sons when I went to start this trial, normally I could say, hey, we're going to get some, um, some fairly high mite colonies to run a trial with, guys. Um, by you know, July, um, it's usually, you know, they're starting to deal with mite management. They go, oh, dad, we already hit everybody with oxalic acid shop towels because we were out of sponges to knock the mites back. And we just checked them and all the yards are pretty low mites right now. I go, well, that's good for you, but bad for my experiment. So what we'll do is let's do this. We'll only put in a half a treatment of the oxalic acid, which we knew from, know from uh, previous research, kind of, uh, was fairly efficacious, but not really good efficacious. So if um, the, they were getting immigration from other hives, that this would not be able to handle the mite immigration. So not the ideal experiment. So we put one half of a sponge in each hive just for a low efficacy mite treatment. And then we assigned, we numbered all the hives and randomly assigned, um, well, we, we did a randomized block design. We, we did mite wash, washes of all the hives and then uh, from the, the two highest mite counts in each yard, one got a uh, guard, one did not. The next two, same thing. And that was then by random, randomly by flip of the coin. So to totally randomized block uh, design. <clears throat> and I just finished um, cranking this data um, this morning. And so here's the results from one of the yards right here. So this would be initial mite count here. And this would be your, so this is in August, this would be the uh, end of September, it might count right there. And then the absolute change with just subtracted the, the uh, um, beginning from the answer, whether mites went up or down. So we would notice if it was due to mite immigration. And what you can see is we did have, um, one of the hives actually went down in mite count uh, fa fairly well. Um, this would be in one of the guarded hives right here. Um, don't see any going up there. And then over here, we had the same thing in the control hive. And we looked at the median for the absolute change or the means, there wasn't any difference. And there wasn't any difference in the next yard, the next yard are not in any of the seven yards. So we can't, this does not support that there was a benefit against the mite immigration. Unfortunately, we didn't see much mite immigration this year in anywhere in our operation. So we're not really sure whether for some reason there just wasn't um, two years ago, we saw tons of mine immigration, but so we were very frustrated this year. We didn't see much mine immigration. So I can't say this is a de definitive, you know, end of the subject treat, uh, trial, but we were disappointed on, on, on the results. Now, yeah, go ahead. Um, there's a lot of robbing in October, November here in upstate New York, and uh -huh. uh, mite, mite bombs infect every hive um after the late treatment is yep. there a place for a late treatment we have brewed until mid-december in upstate new york sure and and if robbing is an issue that may very well be now unless you're putting it on the robbed hive though it won't help it won't help putting it on your hive if your hive is robbing because your forage is going to come back carrying mites it would only help if you put it on the robbed hive to keep your bees from getting into it but well, that means you'd have to put it on your neighbor's hives because your bite, your bees are already, you've already controlled the mice in your hives. So I don't know that they would help you guys there either. Um, what any suggestions for what type of treatment we should use in that um, situation? For that, there that it is tough. I know the beekeepers in uh, Bay Area where we have a lot of uh, huge intense mite mite drift. They're <clears throat> they're using the extended release. Um, what, my, what we've also done is we've put on formic or thymol along with the extended release at the same time. So my sons, when, when they're putting on an extended release, which is a, a slow long-term treatment, they'll also put on thymol treatment or formic treatment at the same time initially to, for a quicker knockback. So either of those um, 
it's, it's tough. That's tough. I mean, your best treatment is to go talk to your neighbors and say, come on, take care of your mites. <laughs> so they don't all show up in my house. Good luck. Okay. okay, so the next trial, we went back to do a, uh, a, a count actual mite immigration. And you do that by zeroing the mite count in the hive. So we, we started with 36 hives. We applied at the same time three, synth uh, three miticides, two synthetic uh, amitraz and then uh, um, uh, fluvalinate and an extended release pad to the colonies as they were growing fairly early in the season. So as they grew, uh, we eliminated mites and mite counts were zero, um, uh, did very well. So only maybe a couple that were not completely eliminate that. Then this is what our summers uh, looks like here. It's pretty darn dry there. And at, we chose 24 of the colonies and gave half of them uh, guards, again, assigning them uh, uh, I can't remember how we signed, signed them, but we gave half of them guards. <clears throat> the question was, by putting these guards on, so now you have the entrance guards, you also have the guards of the colony here, that now they have a place to protect the entrance. So when a, um, a drifting bee, a robber or a, a drifted young bee comes over here and tries to get in, they may get rejected by these guards. The problem, just so you understand, with mite drift, most mite drift, other than um, places where there is a nectar flow on, late in the season um, is by young bees, house bees, that are flying out for their uh, first defecation flights and they get lost and they drift to another hive by uh, odor. Unfortunately, those bees are the bees with the highest mite infestation rate in the hive. So in most areas, um, uh, mite immigration is not due to robbing, it's due to simple drifting of young, young bees from hive to hive. <clears throat> So we put uh, sticky boards on the bottom of every one of the hives and then did mite counts three times a week. And then over the course of the 49 day trial, we swapped the guards from the hives with them to the hives without them to see whether there would be a change in the mite daily mite drop when we added the guard to them. Um, I haven't uh, worked that up. Oh, here's the data, we got 432 sticky board counts right now, all um, data to enter. This is my uh, assistant this uh, season, Rose, has helped me out quite a bit. So we're out there in the morning doing all these sticky board counts. But our first glance is, it doesn't look like there's a, a, any substantial effect there either. Disappointing again. Okay, so we tried a couple of things. Let's go back to the extended release oxalic acid. I, I talked to you before about all these other matrices that I tried uh, two years ago. And the ones that we looked good were the Swedish sponges worked very, very well and the uh, maximizer uh, pads. And we've used both of these successfully since then. But I was still very much interested in cotton, although not in this form. So I wanted to try a completely biodegradable, all cotton matrix. So um, I don't want to have any plastic in it. I don't want to have uh, plastic waste out in my yards that um, is non-biodegradable. Um, so I tried uh, terry cloth, tried sweatshirt fleece, and I'll tell you, pure cotton sweatshirt fleece is really, really hard to find these days, but I, I found it. And then um, a beekeeper um, from the Southeast suggested using a, a cotton batting. So I did use a uh, cotton batting, and this, I really, really was counting on this working. I really liked it a whole lot. Very inexpensive and pure cotton. <coughs> I tried um, to see how they compared as far as absorption of the oxalic acid and glycerin uh, solution. About 100 grams, 110 go into a Swedish sponge. Um, terry cloth for the same surface area, about a little bit more. The uh, um, sweatshirt fleece, quite a bit less, but the cotton batting, uh, very nice. And I did like this Pelham Raff and Zap cotton batting a lot. Okay, I thought it was gonna be the next best thing. <clears throat> so I made them up here. This is the uh, terry cloth sponges, the sweatshirt fleece, and the cotton batting right here. We went out, um, this was back in May, and uh, we went out to uh, 56 hives in one yard. Uh, and again, uh, randomized block design, uh, laid out all the, uh, the pads on top of the hives, stratified by starting mite count, and then left them in there until it takes uh, final counts in late July. It takes about two months for full efficacy or even 70 days. Okay, went back. And here's our reductions for the um, two yards. Again, you wanna see a lot of blue. So in this yard where there was a nice bloom and no colony deaths, because we started with some 
high my high colonies. What I've noticed surprisingly in the late summer, we can have very high mite levels, put on an extent release of oxalic acid, and we don't lose any hives at all. They all are able to deal with whatever and bring their mite counts down. When we do it in the springtime, they will often die. So I have no idea why, why that is. One of the beauties about doing this research, you usually wind up with more questions than you start with when you're doing these. So I, I don't have a lot of answers on these. Anyway, we got, uh, Decent mite control with the cotton felt, um, terry cloth, okay, cotton bed, okay. Best other than this one outlier by far was with the Swedish sponge. What was interesting, we went to the second yard then. That yard was very, very dry, and several of the high mite colonies had died there. It was a much worse situation. Same, both in the same town, both over the same time period, but the cotton felt did very, very poorly there. Look at these, almost no mite reduction there. Um, the terry cloth, again, did pretty poor, and the cotton batting did terrible. We noticed that all these pads were glistening and moist looking with the, with the glycerin. Some of these in this yard look just bone dry. Now, dryness has nothing to do with water. <clears throat> That's glycerin. Glycerin doesn't evaporate. So why they look dry, I'm not sure. I've got them in plastic bags, you know, do some titration, figure out what happened. But in this yard, even, the Swedish sponges still did a good job. So the, the winners were the Swedish dishcloths, well proven, but they are kind of pricey. The other thing that we uh, use are these uh, Spiltech uh, maximizer pads, much cheaper. They're about 11 cents a, a piece rather than a dollar. And we have used these extensively and they work uh, well too. But the, the, the reason I'm not quite as crazy about them, they do have some fire retardant um, in, in them and, um, um, I'm not sure that they're totally biodegradable either. Okay, so now, next question. Here we're putting all these oxalic acid treatments as extended release on colonies. I'm saying leave it on for 70 days. And people are saying, well, Randy, how much acid is it there on the bees after you've left it in for 70 days? Okay, are you just building up more and more acidity in your hives? So <clears throat> we did some experimentation to find out what was there. How long that does the oxalic acid have a, a, um, a residual action against uh, varroa mite? So residual action is what you look at on any kind of insecticide or miticide, whether some of them, uh, like the pyrethroids, you spray them and, and very quickly, they, um, they are biodegraded and no longer efficacious, okay? Slow residual action. Whereas the organ old organochlorines, chlorines, they had very long residual actions. Chloridane was good for 40 years, you know, for killing termites, 40 years, very long residual action. So the, the question is, how much residual action is there of oxalic acid after you do a treatment? Obviously with vaporization, it does not have much residual action. You have to go back and treat again, four day intervals. And here's the interesting thing to me, throughout the world, oxalic acid has been used by beekeepers extensively for over three decades, over 30 years but nobody's ever, it's only been one study I've seen that even made an attempt to look at what kind of residues were in the hive on the bees to actually quantify the residual action. So that's what I took on to do this. <clears throat> now, first I had to figure out, well, how much should there be on the bees for eff efficacy? Well, you can look at the label, the EPA label for oxalic acid. And what I was able to do is for the dribble application, the spray application, and the vapor application, they say exactly how much to put on for how many frames of bees. So that means I can calculate how many micrograms, millions of a gram, theoretically would go on to a bee. Assuming 100% went on the bees, that none of it went on to the woodware or anything else, okay? But that would give us a high end. For the dribble application, it's a little bit over 100 micrograms per bee. A microgram is a millionth of a gram, so 100 mi micrograms right there, okay? So that'd be, uh, 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 10, 10,000 millions right there. Um, no, let me get the right here. 100 micrograms, forget that. This 100, 110 micrograms. For the spray application, 105 micrograms. And for the vapor application, at the one gram, it'd be 50, but Cameron Jack says it should be about three times that. That'd be about 150. So the take home for known efficacy approved would be 
50 to 100 or 100 to 150 micrograms per piece. So we got this 100 microgram ballpark figure that we're looking at of what we want to see on a bee for rapid mite draw, uh, knockdown. So now let's, how do you determine how many micrograms are on a bee? So in 2018, I spent a lot of time developing this titration method. And just a uh, one fold method, you use a, uh, the right indicator to put in here and um, uh, use it for, if you just have distilled water, it gets to be this blue color right here. If the water has been exposed to the air for a little while, it's a little bit uh, more greenish because of the carbon dioxide uh, coming into it. But this is, would be your reference right here. If you drop in a B, it's got, if it has any uh, high acid residue, it's going to turn towards the orange. Now, we're no longer determining if it's oxalic acid, we're just going for pure acidity, okay? So I, what I've done is, is I calculate oxalic acid equivalence, okay? So I'm not saying it's necessarily oxalic acid, I'm talking about acid equivalence to that amount of oxalic acid. <clears throat> then what we do, we use a titrant that we make up, and we drop it in one drop at a time. And we can calibrate this titrant so it's either represents one microgram of oxalic acid or 10 micrograms. I'm gonna start using five also. I'll, I'll have three of them coming up pretty soon to speed us up here. But we've done all this with either one, one drop, uh, 10, one microgram per drop or 10 microgram per drop, depending upon which vial we use. So if it's, if it's really, really yellow, we may put in two drops of 10 and then finish it off with single drops to um, get an accurate uh, titration. And we titrate it back drop to drop. So the color comes back to the starting color. Then that tells you how many micrograms uh, there were. Yeah, Pat. Okay, someone's wondering if you can use the extended release and then use oxalic vaporization at the same time. Um, it's not legal to use extended release. Okay. You gotta be, I can't answer some of the questions that are being asked because it's not legal to use. Okay, and I can't, um, and I've never done that experiment. So unlike most people talking to you, I won't make a guess. <laughs> so I don't know. So one question you might ask is how much oxalic acid is a microgram in millionth of a gram? Most people have trouble imagining a millionth of a gram. So I took my, my little um, measuring spoon. Here's some crystallized oxalic acid dihydrate wood bleach right here. And I broke off the tiniest little speck right here that I could. And I dropped that little tiny speck into a test tube and it turned it bright yellow. Then I titrated it back and it took six, it was equivalent to 65 micrograms of oxalic acid. So if, um, that's, the, and I know that from experience now, if you do an oxalic acid dribble in a hive and you go back after half an hour and take out bees one at a time and titrate them, the ones with the highest levels will have about that 65 microgram levels. That's, that's actually a very realistic level. So essentially, I can tell you, after an oxalic acid dribble, the bees with the highest <coughs> levels on their bodies have maybe about that much oxalic acid on their body. It's a very, very small amount. And it's not spread evenly. It'll be in little tiny itty bitty drops on their body, little, little, um, uh, little spots. Okay. Now, back in 2018, when I was rocking and rolling in this, I had frozen a bunch of samples of bees to titrate and then realized, oh my gosh, the residue, if I put, have bees with known levels of oxalic acid on the bench and have titrated them and know how much they have, and then try to show somebody three days later, it's a whole different number. The acid disappeared on the bees. And I tr did it again and again. I go, oh my God, I don't know what's happening. Where is the acid disappearing to? And it's been on my to-do list since 2018 to return to this um, uh, and figure it out. And just been bothering the heck out of me. And then this year I um, got a new helper, Rose. And I said, Rose, this is gonna be our project this year. Let's titrate and find out what's happening. So how rapidly does oxalic acid degrade once it's on a bee? So what we did, we, and this for our preliminary work, we uh, took cups of screen on them, mixed up known oxalic acid solutions, dipped it, froze, took some fresh bees out of a hive with no residues at all, dipped them quickly in a solution, pulled them out, shook them off, dumped them out on a paper towel, <coughs> and then let them air dry and uh, titrated them. 
um, um, uh, starting at every few minutes and then over the next 12 days to see how much, how long the oxalic acid would last. We also took drops of it and put it onto plastic cover slips, um, just acid alone in water, acid in glycerin, acid in sugar solution to see um, whether it was the bees chitin that made a difference um, or whether it was the sugar or the glycerin or whether all oxalic acid degrades. We also vaporized uh, some bees right here to see what would happen. And if you take a look at a bee after vaporization, you can see the little tiny uh, uh, oxalic acid crystals right here on the hairs on their bodies, a little bit more close up. And I've got a bunch of photomicrographs at much higher magnification. They're just fascinating looking at all these tiny crystals all over their bodies. But these are little tiny amounts. And this bee right here would um, run somewhere maybe around 100 microgram dose for the whole body with all these crystals. So here's the results. This is the, the uh, uh, amount to, to titrate. Um, um, so this would be 10, uh, 10 times this amount, so 10, 10 microgram uh, drops right here. So this would be around 100 microgram dose right here. And this is hours, half an hour, one hour, two hours, to 12 hours, after 24 hours right here, one day, and up to 12 days. This is the drop right here of just the oxalic acid and the water on a plastic cover slip. Notice zero degradation. It all stays right, right there, okay? Now, if we did it, uh, added glycerin to it, put it on the plastic, it degrades, it neutralizes pretty quickly and loses much of the acidity. By even the first day, you're down to about half the acidity, okay? If you put it on the, um, uh, uh, let's see, that was just, okay, that's some plastic. Okay, now if we vaporize it, but on the vaporization, it starts out up here. And again, drops off quite a bit, drops down to still a little more than half after one day. But by, uh, by the time you get to two days, it's, pretty, it's down to about half of the amount. And then by six days, there's no more on the bees anymore. Um, the oxalic acid uh, and sugar dribble on the bees' bodies um, right here. You see, it starts off pretty high and it just drops very, very rapidly going, going down here. Um, and then oxalic acid in uh, water here, again, still, even in the water, drops down. And even if you freeze the bees, the light blue is frozen, it also drops down a little slower. The point is, oxalic acid gets neutralized really fast. If you mix it with anything, any organic matter, or put it on the bees. So we learned something. You can't freeze them for titration later. I took all those frozen samples that I had that tediously hours and hours and threw them all away. We can't even take them and walk back to the lab. If you look at this, even in the first hour, you can get tremendous loss of oxalic acid or acid activity. So what we realized, we had to do it right in the field. And here's Rose starting out when the first days of next to my house, figuring out, as we work together, figure out how to titrate these very quickly in the field. And we can do this just lightning fast. It takes about 15 to 30 seconds to do a titration. It's, it's, it's pretty quick, okay? And Rose now, is, she's a titrating expert. She's done thousands of these titrations. We did a lot of experimentation, figure out how many bees to do what we, how we wanted to do it. So you start off first with the, all your samples um, set up just, just right, same color. <clears throat> then we, we did 10 bee samples to get an average acidity for 10 bees. And you see this one had the most acid. Uh, we always have a reference solution. We leave in the, in the racks we can compare it to. So this, this one had the, um, the, uh, uh, the least acid, a little more acid and the most acid. The more yellow it is, the more acid. And then we'll titrate it back, count the number of drops, and this would be your microgram equivalents uh, 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 per the uh, 10 bees. So this is 50 for 10 bees, so that'd be five micrograms per bee on average uh, right there. So it'd be three micrograms per bee it, it worked out to. So we can get these very accurate averages. The reason is for averages, there's a huge B2B variation within the hive. So if you pick up bees and try to trade them one at a time, um, you get wide ranges in any hive. So the question at this time, okay, we got we to figure it out how to do this. I wondered, well, how much is left in a hive 
after two months. And we had just finished the other experiment where we had colonies that had had these sponges in for 70 days. We're already now into, um, into July. And I go, wow, let me go out to one of these. So we set up a bunch of titration tubes out there in the field. This is right out on top of the car and put three bees into each one. We use a, a light forceps. It's important to use a light forceps because if you squeeze any poop out of them, the poop is alkaline and it turns the solution bright blue. <laughs> you can tell immediately. You can't get, you can't squeeze the bees at all. And it doesn't kill the bees. Okay, so we wash it off and just a little shake and immediately the solution will change color. So we first we look to see what would happen with an untreated hive that never had oxalic acid. There is no color change whatsoever. We have checked uh, control hive after control hive, and there's never any color change at all in a hive that has not had oxalic or formic acid putting into it. But if you put in, uh, uh, these are three B samples, and you see the range of colors right here, and always compare it to the reference sample right here. Um, and uh, let me go back one, oops. Uh, let's go back up to here. Um, so we, we could tie through these down. And I thought I showed it. This, it was about um, three micrograms per B um, on average after those 70 days with that treatment. Very, very low. <clears throat> so once we found that out, we knew that you, you're not going to have much even after a month. I was curious, somewhere between the beginning, whatever the dose was of that and 70 days, we dropped down to about three micrograms per B in there. So we, we were getting ready to go for this trip to Germany. We, we already knew that in just under two months. So we threw this together really, really, really fast. And we couldn't find any colonies or very few colonies that had never been exposed to oxalic acid because we're using it in our, in our operation quite a bit. So <clears throat> we had some colonies left over from some trials that we had used for formic acid uh, treatments uh, and time well treatments earlier in the season. So we got 16 of those and brought them home. And they did have, a, we found out, boy, if you've done a formic treatment, that paper that's left from the formic acid strips on the um, sticks to the top bars, that's red hot acid <laughs> for a long, long time. It's really hard to find a colony um, that has zero acidity if it's had an oxalic acid treatment. And the method is extremely sensitive. We have to, I have to take the forceps and dip them in, in distilled water between these samples, if I have a sample with a high oxalic acid uh, on the bees, because it'll contaminate the bees and the subsequent samples. So this is my uh, home yard right here next to my house, where we, Rose and I set up the lab with these 16 colonies and put in 16 different applications, or 15 different application methods of oxalic acid. Uh, one control. Um, so these are the treatments right here. So, um, uh, and we changed the ratios of uh, oxalic acid to glycerin on them. We also did one with sodium bisulfite, another acid source, food grade, and one with citric acid, another uh, acid also. Okay, so here's some pictures. We also did it with oxalic acid vaporization with one and a half grams per box, <coughs> which um, um, is um, still over recommended, and three grams per box, so six grams for the whole whole colony right here. <clears throat> and what we found is, is right after that, um, there would be a few bees that got hit pretty hard with acid right here. You see the acid residues right here. <clears throat> These bees walked out alive and we watched them die right before our eyes. So this was, so I picked one of them up, this one right here. You can see all their acid crystals. I don't know, it must, they must have been right in front of the jet when it first came in because the rest of the bees don't have anywhere near that acidity on them. Um, this one here titrated out to 1,100 micrograms, <laughs> okay? 10 times the maximum of allowed uh, dose. And yes, that was toxic to that B right there. Then we did three different uh, dribbles. There's Rose putting some dribbles on the hives. And the seven different kinds of sponge applications. <clears throat> one of them, I put one half sponge on a rim above the top bars of a double and two sponges across uh, the entrance at, on, the, on the bottom board for the bees walking through just to see whether they even had to be in the middle of the brood nest or not. One, no glycerin at all, it's put in dry. And notice the bees cover the surface 
with a thin layer of propolis, they chew a little tiny bit, but where the um, frames, uh, the bottom bars came down, they made a bridge of um, propolis to close it off right there. So they didn't have any contact with that at all. But this is an interesting salt on the dry one. And then we use these New Zealand strips. Um, and these came from New Zealand, these dry strips. And I use three different ratios, my one-to-one -one ratio, the New Zealand one to 1.5 ratio, they like a little more glycerin, and the alluin cap ratio, one to 2.5, very high glycerin, which I find sometimes causes adverse effects. Then we took, we would take three five B samples from each hive. So, so we get the average of five Bs and do it next to a reference solution. You see these guys had a fairly high level of oxalic acid on them. <clears throat> Pick them off. I'd have the same frame with a, a green marking on top. I take my portable little numbered vials that are test tubes and rows that have set up for me with the corks on them, put five bees in each one, then set, take them over to the lab. And I set, um, I had an old uh, trader lab next to the house. So I made this special table for her with a, um, a light up above, painted the wall white behind. So we had even white lighting behind the rack where we would look at them. And here's our, our vials of titrate and stuff and a calibration solution of oxalic acid to make sure that we're very accurate. We can always, cal we can always calibrate it to, to confirm that we are accurately calibrating down to the microgram. Lots of distilled water. We go through tons of distilled water. <clears throat> and there's Rose at work titrating uh, away. So I'd be out taking uh, these samples and uh, bringing them in and then she'd be titrating them, and writing them all down on the data sheets. And we had lots of titrate. I took this picture this morning here of this is just some of the data of, of uh, uh, titrating different samples. All right, we got the blindfold off. <laughs> we now know more about oxalic acid residues on beast bodies than anybody else on the planet Earth. And in a couple of minutes, you're going to know more than everybody else on the planet Earth of what's happening in the hive. Here's the vapor and the dribbles. So these are the average oxalic acid equivalent per B, okay, in micrograms. So I divided those five B samples by five to come up with how many micrograms on average the bees had. And then I took the, the average of the three five B samples. So this is really the average for 15, 15 bees. But even the five B samples varied tremendously from sample to sample. Uh, I, I should show you the raw data. Oh, that's interesting. I wonder if I can. Well, I can't enlarge it, but you can see here we have a sample A, B, and C going across, uh, and you can you can see this wide range. That was a zero. That was a three, and that was a seventeen. All from the same <laughs> the same uh, uh, frame of five Bs. That huge variation, and then. We also have these, these variations where this is just where we got a hot, one probably high acid B that threw it off right there. But you can look at the curves. So this is the baseline count before we start. They're all down very close to zero. We put our treatments on, on the vapor and dribbles, and this would be at day one. The vapor and dribbles, we also took these points um, prior to day one, seeing that they do spike up quite high at about two hours after treatment. And they start to come down uh, very quickly after that, after day one. Then they kind of hold for a while, start to drop down towards zero. And then I reapplied the dribble treatments here and they spike back up. I also reapplied uh, a vaporization at a lower dose than uh, this one right here. So they spike up and then drop down very quickly again and stay down that, that low range here. These are the sponge out patients. They don't get that initial spike at all. <clears throat> the sodium uh, citric acid did this um, for some reason, I'm not quite sure why, but they all kind of then even out again. Um, and here's the interesting one. That's the dry sponge with no glycerin at all, just straight dry oxalic acid dissolved in the sponge, evaporated away. And it's tracking right in there with the ones with glycerin, which is making me wonder whether the glycerin is even necessary at all. I can't find out until next year. <laughs> I have no idea whether it was, we're not checking for efficacy. We're only checking for oxalic acid residues or, as, or acidity. This is for the New Zealand strips and the shop towels, the two half uh, shop towels. 
right here. So shop towels, which we know work fairly well, and I reapplied them also. Um, started off fairly decent, big change day to day, but that's just random chance to get different, different bees. Um, and again, fairly stable along here also for them. And nothing really uh, stands out. Um, the black line is the New Zealand ratio, the one to 1.5 that they like, which looks like maybe it's a little better here, but then here's my one to one ratio, which towards the end looks like it's pretty much the same. <clears throat> okay, so the take home from this, for all these application methods, we may start off high, but we're gonna wind up about zero to five micrograms for B, kind of consistent on most of them over time. We also use it fluorescent tracers to track. So I dissolved um, a glowing fluorescent tracer into the dribble solutions. And I did it also with the sponges and stuff and then expose the bees to it. And then you get, put them under black light. We put a, um, have a black light, flat, we did all kinds of black light things. But we found the easiest thing is to go right out to the field, put a, open up a black garbage bag so it drapes over our heads, get our faces down there in our cell phone camera and put on, a, a, have a, a, a black light, it'll provide a flashlight, and you can see the glow right here, and the glow right here, and the little glows right here and here, either on the bees or in the combs. What we found out is by two days, all that fluorescent tracer just disappears. We wonder, how does it disappear out of the combs? Are the bees chewing it away? And if they're chewing it away, are they eating it or are they just nibbling it away? So I was so curious, I took a, a couple of nukes, um, went to frames of brood and shook all the bees off and brushed, I brushed them off. And then I mixed up an oxalic acid uh, sugar solution um, with the tracer and just painted it right on the comb. So you can see the bright, bright glow. And it went back every day for the next few days. And by day three, there was no more glow at all. Okay, all disappeared. I took samples of bees during that period of time. They're in the freezer. And I was gonna give you the, uh, crush them and give you the results today, but um, just ran out of time. I know from previous work that we can do this. So these are under black light. These were crushed them or looked at them. You can see the glow easily. So it'd be very easy to crush these bees that are in the freezer now, because we're not looking at acidity. We're looking at a fluorescent pigment, which is stable. And I'll be able to tell you whether the bees actually consume that acid and sugar that's on those combs or whether they just chew it off and do something else with it, I don't know. The other big question I have is, we're talking about very low levels of oxalic acid. We're talking about a few micrograms where we know a dose to kill the mites should be up there around that 60 microgram or so. That extended dose of three micrograms, is that a, causing toxicity to the mice and causing them to die? Or is it something else? So I'm curious whether in the neutralization process on the chitin, and I spent the morning going over chitin, <laughs> insect chitin and acidity, um, and the chemical reactions involved. <clears throat> Does that change the volatiles coming from the bee's exoskeleton and disrupt the mites as far as them being able to identify the proper HB to get on, jump onto a nurse bee, or does it change their uh, something else with the bees scent? So I set up this um, um, uh, bioassay right here, where I can uh, put two groups of bees in on either side. These are stainless steel gates right here. The bees can't go through, but the mice can walk through. And I can dump uh, fresh live mites here in the middle, put two groups of bees and let the bees, the mice choose one way or the other. I set this up the day before he left for Germany and <laughs> ran three quick tests, but I had trouble getting enough mites. The problem of having a 1,500 hives where you control mites, you can't find mites at the end of the season. <laughs> we have very few mites, it's a very rare hive. And I'll bring the rare hive home with a high mite count, then try to get the powder sugar or the carbon dioxide and get them out. It's really a pain in the butt getting live healthy mites for this bioassay. So this week, I hope to get back on here and run this bioassay and take from the same colony of bees, take a sample of young bees, split them in two, put them in the incubator, sprinkle one with a little bit of oxalic acid solution, let them sit for a day, 
and then put the oxalic acid treated bees in one uh, side, the non oxalic acid treated bees from the same group on the other side, drop a bunch of mites in the middle and see if they prefer one scent over the other. If they do, we may have learned something really important. Other than that, I have no idea how those low residue levels are causing the type of high efficacy that we're seeing with the extended release of oxalic acid. Um, so our take homes, oxalic initially degrades very rapidly in the hive, but then they have a low level of acidity that persists for quite a while, but very uneven on the bees. And we can tell that with the fluorescent tracer. <clears throat> Somehow that acidity appears to slowly decrease the row population over time on the extended release. This drops it down to, take it down to zero, and we have no idea why. Okay, let me do two quick uh, other ones. Let's do one more. Thymol. I also like thymol. We use it for our August mite treatment, very good. And I've used ApiGuard for a number of years, but it's kind of, there's issues with the, with the ApiGuard. I like the treatment a lot, but I was curious. Back in 2017, I was doing a bunch of experiments of mixing different ratios of thymol and, and alcohol and vegetable oil, putting them onto homozoic blocks, the uh, fiber board, insulation board right here, <clears throat> to see how the bees responded to them. What I found is if you put it oil with the thymol, which many beekeepers do, a thymol and oil put on shop towel or something, the bees will propolize them over. If you don't put any oil in at all, the bees will chew that homozoic away and disappear from the hive. I thought, wow, that's way cool. I like that disappearing right there. <clears throat> the other thing is, the release of thymol is very, very slow from the homozoic because it's so thick. I already knew that if I do thymol on a shop towel, the release rate is so fast through the surface area, it'll blow the bees right out of the hive. If you put in a big enough dose to really do good row control, you have to do multiple treatments. On the other hand, I thought, well, what if I put it in the thymol into a thicker matrix, thicker than either the thymol virus strips that are used in Canada or the uh, ape, ape life var, which is the, uh, the thin cellulose strips, or um, from the apigar gel, which is in the polyacrylate gel. What if I make this thick half inch treatment? So the thymol, people think the thymol evaporates rapidly. That's totally erroneous. It's extremely slow evaporating. Time has a very, very low vapor pressure. And by locking it into this thicker homosote board, um, it can't evaporate out quickly. And it doesn't seem to bother the bees. So we put in these different doses. And I just sent this off to American Bee Journal. This article is going to come out, being published this next month, of Into the Hives. And was amazed the other registered treatments give about a 12, a 12 gram dose of time all to a hive. If you put that 12 grams on a shop towel, you'll blow the bees right out of the box. If, but if it's extended release, it works, but they still require two treatments. So I tried 12 grams on homosote, put into hives, and the bees totally ignored it. They didn't restrict brood rearing. They seemed to just laugh at it. So I tried 24 grams, and the bees still took it really well. So I went to 36 grams, and a very brief brood break, but look at that. They still would come back, and they rear brood even with that 36 grams on. So um, I said, well, how about, oh, this, oh, so I did some in the rim, I did some down in between the brood chambers. So here's 24 grams between the uh, brood chambers and the bees just keep rearing brood the whole time. Unlike uh, with Apigard, they, sh they stop and they shift the brood nest away. They, they, just, they would keep doing it. So then <laughs> in Bolden, <laughs> I tried 48 grams, okay? four times a dose in a rim on top. There's that colony two months later. Full of brood, looking really good. There's a brood, 48 grams on top of the box. Now, there was some restriction of brood, right, a little bit, but one single treatment. You don't have to go back at all. Just go in and put it in one time. So I'm very, very interested in this. So this is very preliminary uh, work on very low. Oh, I didn't show you. Damn, I made up a dose response curve. Oh, well, um, very curious about this, whether um, this we can get a register, somebody will register this, okay? But um, 
it's looking really, really promising. It's a new application method for time wall. And uh, I think I'll just cut it short there. I got more on using formic acid during the summer, but I thought maybe we'll just go to question and answer here. Let me, um, and thank you for support beekeepers everywhere. All my research is paid for by beekeepers. I figure if, if um, you guys want it, you'll fund it. If it's not worth it to you, then I'll stop doing it. <laughs> really, really easy, okay? I don't get any government support. Don't ask to do any grant writing. If beekeepers want it, I'll work for you. If not, I got better things to do. Um, so let me just discuss one thing, Pat. The, um, there's a really interesting story back when we got tracheomite. <clears throat> and tracheomite, we lost 70% of our colonies in California when tracheomite first invaded. It was really um, a disaster for us. And everybody's going crazy using menthol and this, that, and the other thing to try to control tracheomite. <clears throat> Rob Page, Dr. Rob Page, was working at the Tucson lab and they were doing experiments. And in order to keep, um, they were taking tracheomite leaves older bees and then goes and in quest that smells for a young newly emerged bee before the hairs around their spiracles, their, their breathing tubes have hardened up. And the young mite has to enter the young bees breathing tube, spiracles, um, before, um, here, let me uh, get off my uh, share here, has to get into the breathing tubes uh, before they harden up. So they were taking um, young bees and putting them into uh, containers and, put, and putting in infested older bees. And what they found was when, you, when, when they use containers in an insect lab, you typically take Vaseline and put it around the top rim of the container. That keeps insects from climbing out. You can do the same thing with honeybees. And what they found is one day they ran out of Vaseline. And they, or let me say this, one day they put the bees in the tub, in the container, and they could not get them to get infested. There was no transfer of mites to the young bees from the old bees. And they wondered what it was. And they looked back at their lab notes and they realized, we ran out of acid the other day and we used Crisco instead. And they did experimentation. They found out, wow, if you expose the bees to Crisco, the mites cannot enter the young bees. They don't recognize the smell of them. The odor of Crisco would disrupt the mites, the tracheal mites ability to recognize a bee of the right age. I mean, it's a fascinating story. Okay, I'm gonna write about that because everybody should hear the story of serendipitous discoveries. I'm curious whether oxalic acid is doing the same thing on the bees. Something about this, the disruption of olfaction. And that's why I'm gonna get going on this bioassay and see whether there is a clear difference in mite um, um, movement towards one group of bees rather than the other. So um, I'm very excited to get, I'm, oh, I'm, <clears throat> the reason I'm coughing <clears throat> and is because I'm just recovering from COVID. I came down with a case of COVID on the way home from Germany last week. So um, I haven't been able to get out to do a whole lot of research right here. Um, so I've been cranking data, but hopefully this week I can get out there and we're gonna see if we can get that, find enough mice to, make, to test that bioassay. Okay, so at this point, I'm happy that for questions. Okay, um, someone asked about thymol extended release Swedish sponge with glycerin. Any data? Um, I did, I tried thymol and oxalic acid together on um, uh, cotton matrix, um, thinking that um, if you take cotton and just the glycerin, they tend to remove it. If you take thymol, um, on cotton, they remove it very fast. I thought maybe if we put a bit of time on in with the oxalic acid glycerin, it would cause the bees to, to remove the, the strands of cotton and drag them through the hive and spread the acid around better. Didn't work. These didn't, didn't cause the bees to do it any faster. So um, I try a lot of these experiments. Many of these experiments are dead ends. Another person asked about, have you ever worked with cedar side as a 
treatment. Why don't you spell that for me? Um, C E D A R, like cedar tree, cedar side. No, I haven't. I've got some uh, fir extract from uh, got one of the Eastern European countries. Somebody uh, sent me. I've been wanting to try there, but I haven't tried any cedar extracts. You know, there's, there's a whole bunch of plant metabolites that are repellent to insects. And um, people come up with all kinds of ideas. When you do, check the European literature. So the Europeans tested a ton of these things many, many years ago. And a lot of them look good in the lab, but then when you actually, you wanna find something that has a high, uh, a high toxicity to Varroa and a low toxicity to the honeybee. Honeybees don't like most of them. Most plant metabolites. The honeybees don't like essential oils. People love essential oils, love to put them in their baths, love to sit on the house. Essential oils, the plants that make essential oils, not to make bees ha insects happy. It makes it to repel bees or to kill them. Bees hate essential oils. They hate thyme oil. But what I found is in the homo cell blocks of the same relief, they don't, that doesn't seem to bother them like it does with some of the other application methods. If you use the Apolife VAR, they put eucalyptus all and menthol and also and some camphor. Man, do the bees hate that treatment. I mean, you hear the colonies roaring from a mile away. I mean, they really hate it. And you, I see, get all these things, beekeepers make these essential oil mixtures going, oh yeah, let's just mix everything up, put it in the hive. It just hammers the brood of the bees. They just don't like a bunch of essential oils. So we do use time oil. We want to put a time oil application method just because it's very well proven time oil and um, safe for humans. And I'm just amazed how well they're tolerating it by the homo uh, method. Hey, is the ratio of oxalic to gl glycerin a one to one by weight or volume? By weight. And that can be confusing because uh, the, the uh, Arginine people, they did a weight to volume. So I do a weight to weight to keep everything straight there. Oxalic or glycerin is more dense than, than water. So it's at 1.26 instead of one specific gravity. So that throws things off. So I, everything is weight to weight. Did bees okay. develop resistance to tracheomites? Oh God, yes. Took about five, six years and can almost complete resistance. Um, as far as the use of uh, extended oxal oxalic that they have in Vermont, do you have any wordage on your website that people could use um, when crafting something for their state? Um, your best bet would be to ask Jack Rath at Better Bee or the oh. Vermont, Vermont Beekeepers. Okay. <laughs> and I'm not sure that's the optimal. I mean, the optimal to me is the New Zealand wording. <laughs> Beekeepers, yeah, go ahead. On your own, you take the risk. So that, so that employees, um, EPA has to cover their butt on everything. They got to say, oh, you have to use this thick of a glove. You know, you have to use a respirator. You have to do this and that and other thing. New Zealand said, we're not worried about it, guys. As long as you do it on your own colonies and you take full responsibility for you and any employees, use, use it however you want. And that is, it's working in New Zealand. For, and New Zealand is really a nanny state. So, I mean, I'm, I, you have to have you know, all these stickers on your cars and everything. They really regulate there, but they let the beekeepers free free track on this, and it works wonderfully. That is what I would like to see. Uh, what are your thoughts on the use of high dose of thyme oil and honey supers? Um, well, the, it's not registered for use. I did some testing because the people are curious about taste. And I did um, found out some people feel they can taste the, the time oil, others don't taste it at all. It's very subjective on that. You'd have to do a really high dose to have any chance of getting any taste there. So the first question I would do is put some on one hive and see if you notice the taste, okay? And if the honey is for personal use, there's nothing to worry about. You know, if it's for sale, you know, see what you're, you know, if, if you notice it or not. It's, it's not like it's gonna hurt you. Time all, I mean, if you listerine mouthwash, the active ingredient, one of them is time all in there. You put time all if you're using any kind of time seasoning in your food. So it's, nobody's worried about you hurting yourself with it. It's just, um, and most people don't notice the, any taste change in honey. 
Okay, going back to the Excel extended release, when is it recommended uh, and how many times and when is it recommended to use during the year? It's not recommended, it's not a legal. Well, if, if it were. Well, if it would, were. What, what would you suggest <laughs> if it were? If it were. That, and that's a very interesting question because even though it's be very difficult, I believe for the bee mites to evolve resistance, it's really important to rotate treatments just so you don't give them the chance. So we like in our operation to rotate between formic acid, oxalic acid, and thymol. Thymol works really well where you have a brood break or, uh, late in the summer, which really well at the time. You guys who have rain and, and bloom and pollen coming in all during the late summer, you are stuck more. So that your, your most efficacious time to use the extended release is why you have your honey supers on because it doesn't bother the, the honey and it doesn't um, restrict uh, brood rearing at that time. And then work in your time all at other times or your formic at other times. Of course, beekeepers always do the same thing. They want to put something on year round and wait like I'm waving a magic wand and think all your trouble is going to go away. And they just in the long term, it's not sustainable. None of those things are sustainable to just do a treatment all the time. So I would pop the one treatment window that oxalic acid extended release would be most optimal probably is when you put your honey supers on so that when you take your honey supers off, it's taking care of your mites at that time. That's the hardest time to get in there and take care of mites when the honey supers are on. So you can put the, the extended release on at when you put your supers on. Oh, uh, one person, um, they talk about the PIG water absorbent mat pad. They've been using it on their hives. They're, um, Looks, looks like they're on experimental hives and it's working okay. Yep. Have you heard of those? Yeah, I've, I've tried that also. Again, I try to stay away from plastic and that one that one does have plastic in it. Now what you have is you're gonna have to dispose of, you know, if you drop those strips out after you're done out in the bee yard, they will cannot completely biodegrade. Um, so you have to dispose of them or you wind up with microplastics all around. That's why I'm trying to stick with pure biodegradable matrices. Okay. Um, someone wants to know about the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, about Apivar. Um, Apivar, we've gotten by, you know, after the first two synthetic myocytes failed so quickly, I said, oh, when Amitraz was available, I said, no, I'm not, not going to bother with that. It's just, um, uh, I didn't want to have a failure again. It's lasted far longer than anybody ever imagined. We are seeing signs of resistance by the mites throughout the world. Some countries, beekeepers have pretty much given up on, uh, on amitraz entirely. Uh, it's been research done recently here in the United States. It still generally controls mites fairly well, but there are strains of mites that have resolved uh, resistance to it. Apparently there's a big cost to resistance to those mites. Um, otherwise, they would have taken over completely, like, like with the other miticides. So it likely means that they give up the ability to reproduce quickly in order to survive. Something that affects them some way. It's also a behavioral disruptor, the amitraz is. <clears throat> so I'm not going to badmouth it at all. Um, it seems to work um, well for most people still. It probably will not continue to work for you know, three more decades. It's not sustainable but it can be used in a, in a rotation. Um, the Canadians found that the best way, uh, time for, rotate, for using Amitraz, the APIVAR strips, is in the springtime as opposed to the fall. It's, it's a little bit too slow acting to be a really efficacious fall treatment for them. Much better, it takes about eight weeks to reach full efficacy. So it would be a, a very good early treatment. If you, um, it does leave contaminate the combs, so, um, in our operation, we choose not to use it. But if you do want to use it, um, it would be very efficacious to use in a nuke or something like that early in the spring to start off with a very clean uh, colony. One person asked, how does one treat colonies where the mite counts are higher two weeks after treatment with Formic Pro with supers on? Yeah, that may, and we know the same thing with Formic Pro. It's erratic, okay? I've got ton of data on my website from research we did uh, two years ago uh, with the Formic Pro. <clears throat> Worked with it again this year, uh, trying to uh, reduce queen loss by covering the top of the strip with foil. That's the other stuff I didn't show you. Um, 
and that apparently does take the wrapper off and put the wrapper over the top of the strip. Um, so it can only evaporate uh, downward and not up. And that seems to help to reduce the queen loss from it. But as far as why in some colonies, um, maybe some colonies direct the ventilation better or something like that. So I don't know what, what happens, but we have noticed it's erratic on those colonies. Um, and I wish I had magic to tell you. Um, one person is asking, is there research on using concurrent mite treatments like oxalic extended, extended and, and formic? I am in Canada. Um, there are some, some researchers doing that. Informally, we, my sons, <laughs> I can tell you right now, have, have been doing that. And they do like putting on, um, uh, along with the extended release, at the same time, if the mite counts are high, either a formic or a time off treatment. For a quick mite knock down, then let, let the extended release handle it from that point on. Uh, would you repeat the robbing screen guard experiment with high mite colonies around again? Okay, robbing screens on your hives are not going to prevent your robbing bees from bringing back mites because your bees. The, the robbers that go out, they know the screen. They're going to go out into those other hives. Mites are going to jump on them because in a uh, high mite hive, the mites start looking for foreign bees to jump on to uh, transmit to other, other colonies. And then your bees are going to bring them right back in. So putting them on your hives is not going to help. Now, if you go out and survey your neighbors and say, how many of you are going to have a hive that's going to crash from poor mite control? Would you mind if I put a robbing screen on your hive? <laughs> that would work, but it's kind of implausible of that ever happening. Um, do you use formic acid dispensers? How much, how often, how? I played with them, but we, um, we run a bare bones operation, the, the simplest types of treatments possible. Um, like the Nassenheider evaporator, it's a wonderful invention. It's a very nice, but just, um, doesn't fit into our commercial operation. We need something that is uh, real quick and dirty uh, treatments. Um, we want to be legal, but we want it to be uh, easy. So um, um, I, I can speak highly for the evaporators, but I have not enough experience to, to talk about it much. Um, is there any insecticide or any other chemicals in homosote that are dangerous to bees? Not that I know of. It's, it's uh, made from recycled newspaper. I, I looked at the material safety data sheet, looked real safe. How did bees develop tracheal mite resistance so quickly compared to the Roa mite? I think you should have flipped that question. Why is it taking so damn long with Roa mites? <laughs> okay, it's, with, it was really easy to evolve resistance uh, for me to breed resistant bees to American fabric, really, really easy with the uh, hygienic uh, brood test. Really easy to breed bees that were resistant to Nosema serrani. Really easy to breed bees that were resistant to tracheal mite. I was really surprised how hard it's been, or I am surprised how difficult it is to breed bees that are resistant to the uh, varroa mite. Um, the mechanisms are not clear. We suspect it may have to do with just thickening of the tracheal hairs for the uh, trigger mite, but we don't know what the mechanism was. Same with Nozema serrani. We had CCD during the um, invasion of Nozema serrani with all the symptoms of Nozema causing your classic CCD symptom, that sudden disappearance of all the bees with a handful of bees and the queen on the brood. That's pure Nozema symptom. That's the only pathogen that caused that symptom. And it was absolutely concurrent with the invasion of Nozema serrani. Um, in a few years, everybody stopped, stopped seeing that. Because some, it, this is an interesting thing. During the um, CCD epidemic, a lot of chat. And I was asked once, are there any breeders breeding for bees that are resistant to CCD? And I said, to the best of my knowledge, I don't know a single breeder who breeds off of dead colonies. So yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's Darwinian evolution. That's, that's breeding. If, if you got a pathogen that's killing your colonies, and you don't treat for it, pretty soon you're only gonna be breeding off of resistant colonies. The problem is we keep maintaining our non-resistant colonies 
against trick against varroa by using the miticides. So that's why I'm walking the walk of my selective breeding program that we don't lose any colonies to varroa, but we because we'll treat them, but we also might wash every colony in the operation. And if they don't need treating, we don't treat them. And that way we can select your breed for resistant colonies, but it takes the work of doing the mite washes. All right, well, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, get well soon. You bet. And, um, okay, that's... I see there's the, 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 those, those of you who are doing uh, late uh, questions, um, you can probably just email me. Uh, keep, your, keep your questions short and sweet and to the point on an email, and I will uh, try to answer them for you. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Good night, everybody.